I guess. So um, thanks to everyone who had tuned in. So welcome back to the session. So my name is Benot Ergoven. I'm a, a researcher based in Aarhus in Denmark. And um, my co-host today is Cameron. So I'll let uh, them introduce and uh, then also introduce the first speaker. Cameron, please. Hi, I've got a um, technical issue with my camera at the moment, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm Cameron. I'm a PhD candidate at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, we have got three talks coming up um, from all over the world, apparently. We've got Toronto, the UK, and we have got um, Canada. The first talk is by Renee, and it is Glitter in the Sky, Transient Astronomy with the Rubin Observatory. Are you there, Renee? Yep. I am indeed. Hi, thanks. Um, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully, this. If, if you don't see anything, uh, please let me know. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's really exciting um, to be able to give this talk um, at all. I'm delighted to be part of the village um, of global people um, in the LGBTQ community. And I think, you know, as a PhD student, I didn't really, I wasn't aware that like the community was so large. So it's really great to be able to speak to you about some of the stuff I am passionate about. So I am an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and I study astronomy and astrophysics. So I'm interested in what the universe is made of, how it's changing with time and how we understand that. Um, and I wanted to tell you about um, a couple of things. The, the first is just the Rubin Observatory and what it is, and then how we can do use it to do science. Um, this is a telescope that will have international reach it's being built in Chile and it will really transform um, science with, um, with optical telescopes. So let's see. Now this is a scene, I used to live in New York City for a while, and this is a scene um, when all the street lights went out, uh, sorry, all the, all the lights went out in uh, New York City. And um, this was during a, a hurricane. And you notice the only lights that you see are the lights of an oncoming car. This is a photo taken by artist Jared Levy in New York City. And I use this as an example because if you were walking around in the city and you wanted to cross the road, you would use the brightness of the headlamps of the oncoming car to tell you how close the car was to you. If the, if the ham headlamps are bright, you don't cross the road. If the headlamps are faint, you think it's safe to cross the road. But if you ask someone how they know how to do that calculation, of course, it's just in, we just understand it intrinsically. We do the maths in our head. Um, but really, this is a um, we are fundamentally relating brightness of an object to the distance of the object. Um, it's one of the reasons, too, that you have car standards, that your headlamps have to be inspected once every few years. Because, of course, if you put a really dim bulb, in a car headlamp, then this calculation would be totally wrong and you would have um, a much greater risk of hitting people. So um, we call this kind of effect and the correlation between distance and brightness, uh, that's something that exists uh, in, in the space too. And so we use and look for bright stars um, where we know roughly intrinsically how bright they should be, just like the headlamps of the car. And then we use how bright they appear to figure out the distance to these objects. In space, we call them standard candles because they roughly standardized brightness. Uh, and so what are they? Well, the type of objects that we can use as these standard candles um, are, are uh, type 1a supernovae to a certain type of exploding star called a supernova. Now I'm going to take uh, show you an image of the, the Whirlpool galaxy taken um, before and after. You'll note in this particular image, I'm kind of giving the game away because there's an arrow where something is going to appear. But of course, in general, in the night sky, we don't see that. And so if I click to the next image, you see there's a very bright supernova that went off in 20, uh, that we saw in 2011 that wasn't there before. So if I go back, you see it wasn't there. And these supernovae are explosions that happen. Uh, we was trying to understand just exactly the mechanisms. There are lots of different proposed uh, mechanisms, but the key thing is that the stars explode roughly at the same brightness anywhere in the universe. And so we can use this brightness relationship to figure out distances to objects in the universe. 
um, this relationship is what allows us to measure not only the distances to objects, but how that distance is changing with time. So it allows us to really probe the geometry of the universe and its acceleration or its speeding up or slowing down as it expands. And we, um, these objects have been uh, the evidence for um, the fact that we think that the universe is accelerating. So it's getting faster, uh, it's getting bigger, faster and faster. Okay, I'm going to show you a prom promotional video for the Rubin Observatory because I want to try and um, explain just how transformative this new telescope is going to be. Um, but it helps if someone made a promotional video for it. So we'll take just two minutes and look at this. The night sky, our window to the universe beyond, immense, mysterious, powerful, quietly beautiful. Cosmic events at the edge of our imagination unfold in the darkness, ready to be discovered. When we look at the night sky, we see into the past, untold stories carried through space by light, the great historian of the cosmos. Technology has evolved over centuries, allowing us to look farther to the edge of our horizon. We invented telescopes to explore and cameras to capture these traveling messages. Yet the changing cosmos remains unseen. A new telescope opens its eye and captures it all. The objects that move and those that flash, even those we cannot see with our eyes. Every few nights it covers the sky, finding all that has changed. And within minutes, new glimmers of activity are carried around the earth to anyone waiting to explore them. What will you discover that no one has seen before? It's time to find out. Now, the Rubin Observatory is named after an astronomer called Vera Rubin, who was trans, uh, transformational in understanding our um, uh, learning about dark matter, which is a substance in the universe that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the Rubin Observatory is under construction now. You'll see some of my photos are, are kind of out of sync as, it, as we um, build the building. Some of these are older photos. But the key thing is that the Rubin Observatory will look uh, it will see a huge pe a piece of the sky at one time. So in this uh, uh, circle, I'm showing you three and a half degrees. Um, we measure um, distances on the uh, scales on the sky in terms of degrees. And um, for comparison, I've shown you the size of the full moon. So it's gonna be able to see a large patch of the sky all in one position. The tiny little inset is the type of, the size of uh, what the Hubble Space Telescope can see. And now the Rubin Observatory, because it can see such a, a large portion of the sky at the same time, it will be able to scan the whole sky every couple of days. And that's really important because it will allow us to make a detailed map, not only of what um, the night sky contains as we look over and over and over again, but also we'll be able to take differences between the sky on day one and day two and day three. And so we'll be able to see how the sky is changing. And that's really important if we're trying to understand new objects that are coming. So I'm interested in finding these type 1a supernovae because they tell us something about cosmology um, and they tell us something about this expansion of the universe. But we need to find many of them um, uh, daily, which is why we have the Rubin Observatory. Now, the key thing about it is that the Rubin Observatory will have many, many pixels. Um, uh, oh, just you give me one second. I'm so sorry. Um, it'll have very many pixels and um, we'll be able to make uh, take these uh, this large camera to take very, very detailed pictures of the sky. What does that actually mean in visual sense? Well, if we take a look at um, the kind of image that we will have seen with 
uh, historic telescopes, um, historical telescopes before the year 2000, they would have been made on plates. And um, we can sort of take an image of what the plate would look like. If we then go to the 2000s, we have t uh, surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which have make more detailed maps. Um, and uh, you can see here that we've gone from something that's blue um, and kind of grainy to something that has a lot more detail. Um, as we then move into uh, uh, surveys that can give us even more detail, but are smaller patches of the sky, um, we, we can build up a big picture, but the, um, the uh, Rubin Observatory is going to enable us to make incredible maps of the sky. Now, another way to sort of put this in context is if we look at the kinds, uh, the expected rates of these supernovae that we see in the sky, we really will fe we'll see that it glitters. And in the past, we haven't had a telescope that's able to scan wide areas of the sky rapidly and uh, repeatedly. And so we'll see very many of these transients that come up. Now, uh, I'm a cosmologist and I want to use these transients to do my science. And I like to use analogies a lot in science. So if we think of all the supernovae that we know to date, there are roughly a few thousand of them. And I like to say, imagine like if we were understanding uh, fish in the universe, the type of the, the numbers of supernovae that we have to date um, are very small and they're very well studied. So it's like we have this amazing picture of this fish and we can really understand it. When we move to something like LSST, we want the volume, we want to really study all of the, the, star, the supernovae um, and the analogy would be the fish in the ocean, but suddenly we don't really know which ones are useful, which ones are the same. And so we need to classify and characterize them a little bit. Um, that's one of the things that we need to be able to do. And so my team and I generated a, um, a classification challenge of data open to the community to try and tell the difference between different kinds of explosions in the sky, some of which will be useful for cosmology and some of which will not. There'll be different kinds of stars. Um, and so how do we do this classification? Well, I told you we take images, we take differences of images taken with different day, on different days, and we use how the image is changing with time. In this case, you see there's a, like a little blob where there wasn't before in the difference image. And we can take those in multiple filter bands or multiple different colors of light. And we can use that to determine what kind of object it is. Now we use that kind of difference image um, and we needed to make a simulation of what we think LSST will see. Um, I did this with a team and I'm advertising it here because we actually made this data completely public um, to the world. And so anyone can actually take your machine learning tools and your computer science and you can play along with our challenge. It's called the Photometric um, uh, LSST Astronomical Time Series Classification Challenge or PLASTIC. Um, and we hosted it on a site called Kaggle. Now Kaggle is a data science site that hosts lots of challenges. Um, and so Kaggle allowed us to put all the data together and perform classification um, over, over the different types of objects. Um, we generated the models, we um, simulated what the telescope would look like, and then we added some detection characteristics to try and make this, um, this challenge. And you see here, and the challenge, the initial challenge ended in, in 2018. However, the data are still available and you can actually still take part. And we had over a thousand people taking part that had some of whom had astronomy experience, but most of whom did not. Um, and this chart that I show um, shows you just how the participation scores changed with time. The key thing about this is because is we need to understand uh, how much of the data is useful and how much will enable us to answer questions that we have about the universe. So finally, you might say, well, why do we need this data anyway? What are we trying to learn? Well, I'm interested in understanding fundamentally what the universe is made of. If I put a pie chart of all the stuff in the universe and we divide it into the things we know, so you, me, stars, gas, planets, um, humans, animals, all of that makes up uh, only less than 5% of the total stuff in the universe. And in fact, most of that stuff is hydrogen gas. We know that about 25% of the rest of the universe is made of dark matter, um, which is matter that um, behaves like normal matter gravitationally, but doesn't interact with light. So if you shine a light on dark matter, you don't see anything. Um, but the rest of this dark, uh, this, com this energy is made of something we call dark energy. Now dark energy is, seems really counterintuitive and you can really think of it as anti-gravity. It's something that's acting against the force of gravity, essentially making it uh, get bigger and bigger and expand. 
um, we would expect the expression gravity sucks, we would expect gravity to make the universe kind of collapse in and on itself after it initially expands. And so dark energy is pushing against that collapse and actually making the universe expand faster and faster and faster. If we can measure these kinds of supernovae, these, these glitters in the sky, we can use them as distance indicators and we can uh, figure out just how this expansion is taking place and just what the universe is made of. Um, so what we do is we try to put everything on a cosmic timeline. What do we think is the history of our universe in terms of the age of the universe? And we know that we started in this hot, dense phase and the universe cooled down and then very slowly stars and galaxies started to form. Um, naively, we would have expected this universe to get bigger and then contract again. But we see that in fact, the universe has started accelerating. Um, and that is uh, sort of counter to our expectations. And we need to do more research and get data to understand this. And that is what the, um, the supernovae measured with the Rubin Observatory will tell us. So I'm going to close now and just say that I'm super excited to be able to share some of this research with you. And I hope that you, everyone, um, uh, really notices and takes uh, account of the fact that we'll have this data. And a lot of it will be public to the world, which means that anyone can go and look at it. And in fact, you can do some really interesting science from, uh, from your desk, wherever you are. The key thing is that as we look into the night sky, not only does it really unify us, but it tells us something about our past and quantitatively what the universe um, has been doing in, the, in, in, the, in its history. Um, and then more importantly, we can use that to say, well, we know based on these models what we expect the future of the universe to be. Uh, I'm super excited and I hope uh, there are some questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much Renee, for the wonderful talk. Uh, that was very exciting to know how fast the universe is expanding. Um, we have one question. Uh, this was uh, from well, my co-host, uh, Cameron. Uh, so how do you determine what is free hydrogen and what may be something such as neutrinos? It's a really good question. One of the things we, we do if we're measuring something like hydrogen, it's actually combining kind of chemistry and physics. We actually look if um, hydrogen gets hot, it gives off a certain kind of radiation. And so we can measure uh, in, in the universe, we can see where this radiation is and that tells us where the hydrogen is. Whereas neutrinos act very differently and they don't give off a signature of radiation. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to encourage uh, participants to post their questions on the question Q&A box. Um, and I, I have one more question. Um, so I'd like to know how one, because uh, dark matter and dark energy, you can't use spectral properties to identify them. And what would be the ways one could use, uh, or what are the techniques one could use uh, to identify these? So I'm sorry, could you repeat the final thing to identify what specifically? Uh, dark matter and dark energy. Ah, yes, dark matter and dark energy. So. Yeah, it's unfortunate that they have such a similar name because of course dark matter and dark energy are very different. But dark matter, uh, we think is um, uh, a particle or something, um, some part of um, matter that we haven't discovered yet, but that has properties that we can uncover. So there are actually lots of experiments looking for a dark matter particle, both on the earth, we fill, we take old mines and we fill them with heavy water uh, deuterium, and then we look for occasional flashes of light when a dark matter particle interacts with a, a water particle. Um, or we can look for dark matter in um, how galaxies behave and, and move around each other. So we can have both kind of detection events and then cosmological implications. Dark energy is a little bit trickier because it only really operates on the very, very largest scales. It changes how the universe expands. And so we can't, uh, it's not a particle that we can find. It's really, um, we need to look at the effects of dark energy. What does it do and how is it changing the expansion of the universe? And that's why we need these large volumes of data to measure um, distances to objects really far away. Dark energy is really, really tricky and um, uh, it's exciting. It's one of, the th one of the reasons why I got into science, um, but we have a very, very naive understanding of it right now. And so there's a lot of work needed on the theory side and on the, on the data side as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Renee. Uh, there's one more question, but uh, I think Cameron will 
ask that question. Yeah, um, Glenn has asked, could the Rubin telescope help with exoplanet transit detections, which I've got no idea what that means. So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so, so briefly, an exoplanet planet transit detection is so cool. Basically, when we have a, a solar eclipse, right, when the moon goes in between us and the sun, it blocks out the light of the sun. But of course, if the moon was much smaller, it would look like a Venus transit, where it's like a little black disk that goes across the sun. We can actually look for um, exoplanets going between us and their star and see exactly the same thing as we would, uh, you know, with a, a transit of Venus. We see the light dips down a little bit. So um, the key thing about um, LSST is that it will, um, uh, it'll be able to measure the, uh, uh, the objects um, with, it's, it's a very big telescope and it will be able to measure things quite fast, but it won't necessarily be targeting a very small part of the sky and going deep on that. Um, so it will be able to measure solar system objects um, and understand what are the um, uh, particles and the, the uh, planets and ob objects in our own solar system, which, was super, which is super important. Um, but it will be mainly looking at um, larger scale things. So um, uh, exploring out to distant parts of our own solar system as opposed to targeting a very small area for transient, uh, transit discoveries. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Rene, for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, I am just tracking the questions. Um, so far, there aren't any further questions, but if there are more questions, please uh, let them um, directly know us by the chat or by the Q&A window. Um, so, and also uh, folks could contact me on Twitter as well. I'm more than happy yeah. to ask questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so with that, uh, with the virtual applause, uh, we'll uh, thank uh, Rene for this wonderful talk and uh, we'll quickly move to the next talk, although we are a bit uh, ahead of our schedule. Thank you, Rene. Rene, just before you go, would you mind dropping your um, Twitter details into the chat so I people will. can contact you, please? I will indeed. Thanks, Wonderful. Both. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so from uh, we are moving the continents uh, back across the Atlantic. Um, now the next speaker is from uh, the UK. Uh, so uh, we have Amy Martin uh, who's going to speak um, us and she's uh, there from NHS uh, Lanarkshire and they'll be talking about um, the um, cult uh, cultivating support and challenging uh, differential attainment. Are we failing practitioners, uh, the healthcare practitioners uh, who belong to the LGBT community. So I'll pass it on to Amy. Hello. hear you, Amy. Um, Hi, sorry, I'm just about to screen share. Yeah, sure. Take your time. We still have time until the schedule time, but we could also start earlier if you'd like to. Hello, so I'm Amy, um, I'm a doctor working in NHS Lanarkshire in the medical education team, um, where part of my role is working on unconscious bias and the impact that that has in the, in the medical setting, um, especially from a medical education perspective. Um, with unconscious bias being that um, stereotype based thinking and automatic thoughts that we all have um, but that we are unaware of, and we're unaware of the influence that that can have on our, on our judgments and our behaviour. Um, so I look at what we're both intentionally and also unintentionally um, teaching our uh, medical students um, and our doctors in training. 
So today I'd like to bring in some of that work that I usually do uh, to understanding the impact of bias on our LGBTQ plus healthcare practitioners. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that and bring in differential attainment and some of the available data to put that in context and then finish up with some next steps and recommendations to address this. Um, so just firstly, just to provide a bit of context, I know not everyone is from a medical background. Um, unconscious bias and these related issues, um, such as more overt harassment, have been um, gaining increasing recognition in the medical community um, as um, really valid issues that are deserving of, of prioritization and attention and, and action from the community. And this has been seen um, locally in departments like my own and also on a, on a broader scale in our um, medical organizations like the British Medical Association who have released several um, recent reports um, committing to, to addressing this. Um, and of course, if we look at um, wider society, this has only been amplified more with the conversations that we're all having um, after the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, and um, as well as the health inequalities that have um, kind of been re-emphasised by the by the pandemic. Um, so we do have this um, body of evidence that's available, um, looking at the impact of bias on LGBTQ plus patients. Um, but as I said, I'm going to draw on that, but look at the more neglected area of the research, which is the impact of bias on our LGBTQ plus healthcare practitioners. So um, what do we know? Um, so we know that, unfortunately, the um, medical community is reflective of wider society in that, I mean, not bias free. Um, so research shows that healthcare practitioners do demonstrate um, both implicit and explicit preference for heterosexual people. Um, and as I said, a lot of the research has focused on the impact of that on a provider-patient relationship, which is really valuable. But if we transfer that consideration over to looking at interprofessional relationships and our relationships with our colleagues in a medical setting, there's some potentially quite um, serious consequences here too. Um, so if we think about um, an individual within that team and the fact that they might potentially not feel welcome because of that bias, um, if we look at a medical workplace particularly, it's quite concerning because medicine is um, so predominantly and heavily team-based and we know that these team dynamics and working relationships are really important to healthcare practitioners for, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, and looking to the research from Catherine Wolf from um, University College London, we can start to understand this a bit better. Um, and her main area of research is uh, differential attainment in medicine. Um, and um, so we're trying to understand why is it that we get this difference in outcome and, um, and different levels of success and achievement if we're grouping our medical students and our, um, our healthcare professionals by their protected characteristics such as their race or their sexual orientation. Um, and from her research emerged that one of the, the key driving factors for this differential attainment gap that we're seeing in medicine is a, a limited opportunity to, to engage with the social learning environment of medicine and the medical workplace. Um, so that being your, you know, your relationships with, um, with colleagues and with peers and with um, mentors. Um, and again, it's only kind of further worrisome when we think about this from a career progression point of view. Um, for medical settings specifically, because um, medicine traditionally has been and, and remains to some extent um, quite a hierarchical profession um, with a lot of your career um, at different stages in your career uh, dictated by a, an appraisal with um, an individual um, senior colleague. So naturally it follows that your relationship with this colleague and their, their perception of you is, um, is very important. 
And this kind of links in with something which has been observed and reported, which is uh, the disclosure dilemma for LGBTQ plus healthcare professionals. And um, that being exactly what it sounds like, um, a kind of when, if, who to come out to at work um, for fear of these um, negative implications, uh, one of which to important working relationships. Um, and this is seen in um, comments from uh, lesbian, gay and bisexual doctors and medical students in a, a recent report by um, the British Medical Association and the LGBT plus Association of Doctors and Dentists. Um, and their report showed that um, of the roughly 800 respondents, only actually a quarter of those felt um, that they were fully out at work and felt comfortable doing that. Um, and uh, it kind of becomes apparent how uh, the kind of working relationships become challenging because um, one participant, one respondent in particular, talked about how they they felt that their colleagues must perceive them as quite cold um, because of this kind of persistent self-monitoring and guarding that they were having to do. Um, and you can see how it becomes quite challenging to form positive working relationships there. Um, and even some, some further implications were on career decision making. So around a third of respondents um, had stated that they had made their specialty choice based on how LGBTQ plus friendly the specialty was, with just under 5% even completely moving specialties because it wasn't LGBTQ plus friendly. And this kind of theme starts to emerge of, of having to make decisions around this and, and concerns around support in the workplace also, with um, around 70% of the respondents saying that they have had a recent negative experience um, related to their sexual orientation in the medical workplace. Um, but only around a quarter of those actually felt comfortable to report the incident. Um, and again, this picture starts to develop of a workplace that's perhaps not perceived as very supportive for LGBTQ plus healthcare practitioners with some of the barriers to reporting um, stated as concerns about um, not being taken seriously or um, even themselves being punished for reporting. So when we have this challenges to developing positive working relationships, um, when we have this impact on career decisions and career opportunities, and this perceived lack of support from the workplace, where can we go from here? Um, so firstly, more data would be great. Um, there's not, as I said, there's not that much focus on the impact of LGBTQ plus healthcare professionals. Um, the available data is also focused on lesbian and gay identities and on doctors. Um, so making this data more inclusive and thought but to other identities, including trans practitioners and expanding to the wider healthcare team would give a more comprehensive picture and that would be really valuable. Um, secondly, education. Um, and while there is a body of evidence that shows that um, LGBTQ plus education for healthcare practitioners does have positive outcomes in terms of increasing um, confidence and, and empathy when talking with LGBTQ plus people. Unfortunately, the, the current state of play with most um, diversity training, as it's known in, in the healthcare profession, is limited to yearly um, online modules. Um, and it has been criticised as perhaps not the most engaging um, way to support and encourage a practitioner to reflect on their own um, bias and the impact that it has on other people. So my department, for example, are developing face-to-face -face educational sessions um, with evidence showing that input from LGBTQ plus people in the design and the delivery is beneficial. Um, and I suppose ultimately, a note on education is that it shouldn't be a one-off. This should be a conversation that we're having. Um, it should, we should be educating us, responsible for educating ourselves and each other and committing to this conversation. And lastly, I wanted to touch on was support. Um, 
So organisations need to enhance that visible support for this community of practitioners, and that includes enhancing their reporting and supporting systems. Um, it's a tough environment to work in the healthcare environment, and we already know that LGBTQ plus people are already disproportionately affected by physical and mental health problems. So getting that well-being and support aspect is is very important to get that right. Um, so and threaded throughout all this um, is this commitment to an intersectional approach and recognizing that our identities don't exist in a vacuum. Um, so an intersectional approach to more data, more education and more support um, is, is my message there. And just, uh, just to finish up, um, I suppose I want to acknowledge that these issues that I've talked about, the unconscious bias and, and different attainment, I uh, acknowledge are obviously not um, unique to a medical field, but as a medical community, when we, when we have such a, a commitment to understanding our impacts on our patients, um, I do think we, we owe the same to our LGBTQ plus healthcare practitioners and they deserve an environment where the workplace is supporting them not just just to survive it but but to thrive um yeah so that's me thank you and uh welcome any questions uh thank you for that amy i've got a couple of questions um you've talked about healthcare practitioners but how much does unconscious bias play into negative outcomes for LGBTQ plus um, patients undergoing primary or secondary care in a healthcare setting? Yeah, there is, there is a good body of evidence around that. Um, so the impact of, of unconscious bias in LGBTQ plus patients um, comes in several strands, unfortunately. Um, and worryingly, what we see is when LGBTQ plus patients um, engage with healthcare services, and they are met with some form of, of discrimination, uh, whether that be on the end of the spectrum of microaggressions and people making assumptions, seeing a wedding ring and saying, oh, how are you and your wife? Or, and making that initial assumption, it starts to create an unwelcoming environment. Um, and obviously the other end of the spectrum is just really overt harassment. Um, and yeah, there's some, there's some upsetting stories and case studies out there. Um, but that does initially create this really uh, unwelcoming environment. And what we see is that LGBTQ plus patients are much less likely to seek care or perhaps they delay seeking care. And that really can impact on their health um, and the relationship with the healthcare provider, the trust with the healthcare provider. Um, so we really need to work as a community to, to support this group of patients and be visibly supportive of that. And it, it, it does start with the strands as I said, with, with educating healthcare professionals um, so that they can have this positive impact on patients and on their colleagues. Thank you for that. Um, earlier on during the equity panel, uh, there was a discussion around education and the effects it can have. What systems are being implemented within um, the NHS or the private sector to um, educate healthcare professionals and have any results come out of that yet? So what education interventions are being implemented in the healthcare sector? Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's really varied. Um, the NHS is a big sprawling organisation um, and being between different departments, the approaches are quite different. Um, but what is really clear is this big commitment at the minute and this big motivation and commitment to that education. Um, so as I said, the typical state of play tends to be um, the baseline is that there are yearly online modules and diversity, um, but what's being recognised is that um, that could be enhanced um, with, you know, workshops, face-to-face -face sessions, um, and also there's campaigns such as the um, Rainbow Badge. Um, some trusts implement a an agreement where you attend an educational workshop and then you receive your rainbow lanyard, um, just to demonstrate that visibility and that commitment. Um, so there's some really varied approaches going on um, at the minute. That's good to know. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, if they could either use the Q&A box or in the chat, that would be uh, 
greatly appreciated. We've got about four minutes um, currently. Anyone's got anything? Um, have the workshops transitioned into a virtual mode during the pandemic? <laughs> yes, there's been plenty of um, changes to, to virtual working during the pandemic in a medical setting. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's a new way of working for all of us, isn't it? And if needs be, yes, um, workshops can be delivered virtually. H has that had an effect? Uh, in compared to face-to-face -face actual discussions, you know, like is there a difference in the effectiveness of them? Do you know? No, I'm not what? sure. I've not had a look at any any studies that have compared outcomes just now. Um, but that would be really interesting. And, and feel free to drop me a message. I can look into that a little bit more. Um, I know just generally looking at um, virtual sessions, virtual educational sessions, just in general, not from a from a diversity or LGBTQ plus point of view. Um, they tend to be comparable, but um, I haven't seen any specific results from this point of view, but it'd be interesting to look at. Um, I agree. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. If anyone has got any questions, are they free to message you via Twitter if you've got it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And would you mind dropping your handle into the, uh, handle into the chat, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks thank very you. much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amy, for the nice talk and um, participants for keeping the discussion very light. Um, now we are switching back continents again. Uh, We're going across the Atlantic uh, to the US. Um, so we have uh, Jesse um, speaking up next. Uh, so Jesse Kushinello Rowland is a physiologist in training. She's a proud cat of uh, cat mom of three, and um, they will be talking to us today about um, pain receptors. So I'll pass it on to Jesse. Thank you. Let me share my screen really quick. Um, Alrighty. So. Um, my, today, I'll be telling you about a project I've been looking at for the past year or so, um, investigating neuroadaptations in a female rat model of combined alcoholic neuropathy and complex regional pain syndrome. So that's all kind of a mouthful, but we'll get through it together. Um, and before we begin, I first want to acknowledge that all of the work that you'll be seeing here today was collected at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, and that our institution, our campus, is built upon the lands of the Choctaw, the Chittimacha tribe of Louisiana, the United Homa Nation, as well as many other indigenous peoples who are not re recognized by the federal and state governments. And New Orleans as a whole is surrounded by lands of a number of other tribes that make up the state of Louisiana. So with that, let's talk about pain. Um, before we can get into alcoholic neuropathy and complex regional pain syndrome, we have to all get on the same page of sex and gender differences in chronic pain. So typically, basic scientists will use the term sex differences when talking about preclinical animal research and gender differences when talking about human research. However, um, up until April of this year, human pain research has only actually looked at biological sex. It has not investigated gender differences. So today I can very confidently tell you at the very least that there are sex differences in chronic pain. Um, we know that people who are assigned female at birth have a higher incidence of chronic pain. They experience pain more frequently and they're more sensitive to painful stimuli than people who are assigned male at birth. And we can recapitulate this in animal models of pain um, across species where female animals will display greater pain sensitivity than males. And the only tidbit of an inkling of an idea of gender differences in chronic pain that we have at this moment um, was published in April from a group out of the University of Alabama at Birmingham, which found that transgender and cisgender women 
report similar pain sensitivities and chronic pain severity, both of which were greater than cisgender men. So this is just kind of the very first idea that we have now that gender may be more important than biological sex when it comes to pain sensitivity and chronic pain incidence, which I'm sure isn't surprising to some of us in the audience, but this is kind of just one of the main pitfalls, I feel at least for the field of pain research, is that we're only now getting into gen real gender differences in chronic pain. Um, but with this in mind, knowing that there are at least sex differences, um, we, my lab, wanted to investigate two different chronic pain disorders that we know differentially affect people who are assigned female at birth than male. And these are alcoholic neuropathy and complex regional pain syndrome. So neuropathy is just a fancy word for any pain that's caused by nerve damage. And that's exactly what alcoholic neuropathy is. It's just that this nerve damage is caused by long-term heavy alcohol drinking. So this doesn't mean that if you drink alcohol, you're gonna develop chronic pain. Um, this is a, develops in a, upwards of 60% of long-term heavy alcohol drinkers. So people with alcohol use disorders um, are more likely to develop this and it's a pain condition. So one of the primary symptoms is an increased pain sensitivity. And we know that people assigned female at birth are more likely to develop alcoholic neuropathy than people assigned male at birth. The second condition we wanted to model was complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS. And this is a chronic pain condition that happens after injury or immobilization of a limb. And even though most cases have a history of trauma or injury, we don't know what causes this. So this trauma or injury could be as simple as a needle stick, or if I were or as severe as if I break my arm, put it in a cast, and then take the cast off, I could develop this pain condition. Um, so we have an increased sensitivity to pain, but here this is excessive, incredible, robust pain. So complex regional pain syndrome is one of the most painful things a human being can experience. It's more painful than childbirth. It is more painful than amputating um, a finger or a toe, um, but we have no idea what causes it. We just know it's more prevalent in people assigned female at birth than male. Um, so with this in mind, knowing that these two pain conditions share overlapping symptoms, they share um, overlapping uh, patient characteristics, patient populations at least, um, we wondered if we could model them together to see if they shared any underlying pathophysiology. Um, so to do that, we modeled both of these different disorders in female rats. So we modeled alcoholic neuropathy just by making rats drink alcohol. Half of our rats got alcohol in their diet, half did not. Um, all of our rats did receive this complex regional pain syndrome model where they had a little cast put on their hind limb for one week. So no injury here, just immobilization. And then three days after that cast was removed, we measured their pain sensitivity. So in this test, um, you just apply a filament to the hind paw of the rat and push up and see what it takes for the rat to lift their foot up. Now, because both of these um, pain conditions are more prevalent in people assigned female at birth than male. We wanted to investigate the role of estrogen and therefore half of our rats received an ovarectomy before the start of the experiment. So this left us with four experimental groups and the colors you'll see here are how they'll be represented in all of the graphs um, throughout my talk. And the first group we have is rats that didn't get alcohol, they also did not have an ovarectomy. So a sham surgery just means the rats were still anesthetized, they still received a surgical incision, but nothing was removed, nothing, they're fully intact, they just got stitched right back up. The second group um, still didn't have alcohol in their diet, but they did receive an ovarectomy. A third group now that has alcohol in its diet, but still didn't have an ovarectomy. And a final group that received both alcohol and ovarectomy. So um, the first thing we did with these animals was to see if we can change their pain sensitivity in this model. 
So on the y-axis here, these numbers are just the, the pressure that it took that rat to lift its foot off, off of that filament. So a lower number means it took less force for that rat to lift its foot up, meaning it, a lower number is a greater pain sensitivity. And we were able to measure pain sensitivity in the leg that had the cast, so the CRPS leg, as well as the leg that did not have the cast. And we found that we successfully modeled CRPS because our casted leg had a way big increase in pain sensitivity compared to this non-casted leg. Um, we also saw that we successfully modeled alcoholic neuropathy because all of our alcohol treated animals had a significant increase in pain sensitivity as well compared to these light pink bars where the rats did not get alcohol. Interestingly to us, we saw no effect of overectomy at all. So these um, lined bars here are overectomized animals and overectomy did not affect pain sensitivity with alcohol, without alcohol, the casted leg, the non-casted leg. Um, and this to us means that estrogen signaling has less to do with the sex differences that we see in these two conditions, that maybe there are some more psychosocial influences on it. Um, just like the one paper that was published a few months ago, gender may be more important than biological sex. And that may be why we're not seeing any effect of overectomy on pain sensitivity in our animals. So we knew we could behaviorally model these two disorders. Um, so we wanted to see then what's happening in the brain. If we can find things that are changing in the brain, we can maybe target them with drugs to treat these two conditions. So today I'll be telling you all um, just about a little bit of the data that we've collected in the anterior cingulate cortex. So this is a limbic brain region, really important for pain conceptualization. And all this means is that the cingulate cortex integrates all the different aspects of pain, right? So the sensory aspect, the ouch, that hurts, as well as the emotional and cognitive dimensions of pain as well. So in this figure here on the right, hopefully you can appreciate this um, blue and red regions are the cingulate cortex, that it's fairly relatively conserved across species, meaning that it's really important for pain uh, signaling. We know from animal models that hyperactivity in the cingulate cortex can drive different aspects of pain depending on the animal model, depending on the pain model. So emotional aspects, sensory aspects, sometimes both. So there are a lot of ways to measure hyperactivity in the cingulate cortex or in the brain in general. I personally look at changes in protein levels using Western blots. So the two big kickers of how I measure hyperactivity are by looking at glutamate receptors and kinases. So glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So when we look at changes in glutamate receptor levels, we can infer changes in glutamate signaling. Kinases phosphorylate different molecules throughout the brain. So when something is phosphorylated, it's typically more activated. So the more kinases we have, we can imply that there's maybe more activation happening in that brain region. So when we looked at glutamate receptors, we found that alcohol in these CRPS animals increased glutamate receptor phosphorylation. So this is just the name of the receptor and the phosphorylation site, which really only means something to neuroscientists. All I want you to take from this is that an increase in phosphorylation of this receptor means that this receptor is likely more activated and there's likely more glutamate signaling happening in this brain region, meaning that there's more excitatory neurotransmission happening. Just like with our behavioral outcomes, we see no effect of overectomy. And when we looked at kinases, there's really two kinases um, that I'm talking to y'all about today, and they are ERK12, sometimes called MAP kinase, um, as well as junk or Janus kinase. And we see again, just an effect of alcohol to increase phosphorylation of this ERK kinase. So phos increased phosphorylation of a kinase means the kinase is more active, so it can go and phosphorylate and activate other things, um, as well as an alcohol-mediated increase in this Janus kinase. So just overall more levels of this kinase, so there's more kinase available to go and phosphorylate and activate more things. 
and still we see no effect of overectomy on either of these proteins. So hopefully today I've convinced you that we have successfully developed a model of combined alcoholic neuropathy and complex regional pain syndrome in adult female rats, um, that perhaps the sex differences seen in these pathologies are not entirely driven by estrogen signaling, and that both alcoholic neuropathy and CRPS seem to cause hyperexcitability in the anterior cingulate cortex. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge my lab, the Edwards Lab, Scott Edwards, um, especially Bradley and Amy, who um, were an undergraduate and medical student who worked on this project, um, Dr. Liz Simon-Peter, who generated these animals, all of our funding sources, as well as the STEM Village for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions either on here, you can email me, you can message me on Twitter, um, and also my laptop is too old to have a version of PowerPoint that does do closed captioning. However, I've typed up a transcript of my talk that I can send out to anyone um, if they need it. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, so there's one question uh, from Serena. Uh, could you elaborate on why you chose to model uh, these two conditions together? Do you think the presence of one or the other could confound your results? I assume those um, two meant the alcohol and mm -hmm. gender. Yeah. So we chose to model these two together. Um, primarily, we wanted to model alcoholic neuropathy just because LSU Health New Orleans has a really strong alcohol research component. Um, and we know that um, there's a really strong relationship between alcohol use and um, muscle dysregulation. And we see dysregulation of muscle in complex regional pain syndrome as well. So Liz Simon-Peter who generated this model um, is a muscle physiologist. So that's why she wanted to model them together. Um, I personally would love to add animals to this who do not get a cast just so we can look at alcohol on its own and cast on its own, um, but that just has not yet happened. But I agree, there could be a potential count confound there. Yeah, um, thank you for that um, answer. Um, I had a question which is kind of a bit tangential. Uh, so there are <laughs> these um, fish species that actually change their sex uh, depending on the environmental situation. So if you if you choose such a species to model pain behavior, uh, do you expect then uh, the reversal of their sexes would then actually matter at all? Because you know that that's how uh, the direction is going where if you condition yourself, you know, gender is more important than sex reversals or sex roles. Uh, so if, if one could do that with those kind of animals, what results one would expect? I'd have to, so we do know in rats that pain sensitivity varies depending on estrus cycle, so depending on estrogen level. Um, so I'd have to imagine that if you were doing it in an animal that could switch its sex, that you would also see differences in pain sensitivity. I think it'll depend on the type of pain, um, which is a whole nother thing to get <laughs> into. Cool question, though. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we have just one minute uh, more for the session to close. Uh, so I would pass it over to Cameron to close the session. Uh, before that, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, Rene, uh, Amy, and uh, Jesse for wonderful talk. And Cameron. Right, wonderful. Uh, thank you for that. Um, as you were speaking, I believe it's Amy Roberts has tweeted, I believe it's a paper which you referenced which was published this year by Stray Fatal. So if anyone wants to check that out, it is under the um, SBBS20 hashtag. Um, so we're going to have a quick break now before we move on to the final session um, of the day. So, yeah, thank you.